Hello and welcome to the Kamla Show, where we bring you interviews and conversations with technologists, entrepreneurs, filmmakers, and other newsmakers from in and around the San Francisco Bay Area. My guest today is Academy Award writer and director Stephen Gagan. He wrote Syriana and Traffic. He recently won the Kanbar Award at the 57th San Francisco International Film Festival. What the rest of the world calls football was my, my big passion, that and tennis. So I, I played um, you know, a lot of tennis tournaments when I was little, and I also I did a lot of um, soccer. Like I, just, I played soccer all day, every day. I was, I, uh, I was, I was all state in you know, a few years and um, got our team to the state finals um, where we lost, but we got to play in front of like 16,000 people. It was so exciting. I mean, it's like that Bruce Springsteen song, Glory Days. I'm just always, <laughs> it's always playing in my mind everywhere I go. You know, I'll see like a five-year-old kicking a soccer ball and I hear, Glory Days, <laughs> you know, and I'm out there. <laughs> it's sort of embarrassing. In part one of our conversation, he talked about the San Francisco International Film Festival, his love for sports and writing. In part two, we talk about why he writes and how he came to write the screenplay for Traffic and Siriano. Everybody in, in my family, me, my parents were like very worried, you know, they're very worried. Uh, put the air quotes with the fingers, our son the writer, with air quotes. <clears throat> but I didn't care, you know, I didn't care, I had to do it. And then you ask why write, and yeah, the reason you write is because you have to. Um, if it's if it's like a choice, you won't do it. There's yeah. so many other things you, one could be doing with one's time that are, you know, more obviously um, beneficial to the planet. You know, you something propels you to write. It's a compulsion. It's a Can't help it. Do it every day. Okay. So addiction. You know. So you've written. What is your addiction with addiction? You've written a book about <laughs> addiction, drug addiction. You've written a book about our oil addiction. Yeah. And now you're writing a book about, I don't know what addiction your new movie is about to be. So what's this thing with addiction? Well, it helps to be an addict. <laughs> um, you know, I just, I think I understand that, that, uh, that side of human nature, you know, where one um, becomes fixated on something beyond all else, you know, for whatever reason. Obviously, it's biochemical on some level, but... Um, you know, uh, it happens in a different way. You know, I wouldn't say that I, s I, I would wake up and go, oh, I want to write about addiction. <clears throat> no, I'm not saying you wake up, but when you look at your body of... No, I'm just saying, I'm saying, but like, I just want to be specific. With traffic, you know, I wanted to write about the war on drugs, which I thought was, was really asinine. And I still do. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, in 40 years of the war on drugs, all that's happened is the price of cocaine has gone down by 75%, while purity's gone up by 75%. You know, anything. You don't have to be, you know, fucking Milton Friedman to know about supply and demand. I mean, there's more of it, it's better, and it's cheaper. You're not winning the war on drugs with an interdiction policy if that's what's happening. And that is what's happening. You can go out on the street one block from here and you could absolutely do all the research you need as to how the war on drugs is working. You know, America right now, we have more African Americans in prison than literally were enslaved at the time, at the time of the Civil War. At the time of the Civil War, how many African Americans were slaves? There are more African Americans in prison right now. I mean, then what do we do? We call, get them on some trumped up drug charge, call it a felony, take away their right to vote. It's like the new Jim Crow. It's complete BS, you know, and it infuriates me. So that's the war on drugs to me. The war on drugs is like, oh, a macro governmental policy where we declare war on human nature. You know, war on human nature, the language of it is, is completely broken. It doesn't work. Molecules don't have morality. There's not a good molecule or a bad molecule. You don't get high, you know, oh, I'm high on Sudafed and coffee, so I'm a good person. Or I'm getting drunk on bourbon, so I'm, I'm like, great. Oh, I drink scotch like a Republican, so I must be cool, you know. Instead, you go, oh, go do the naughty crack cocaine. You're a bad human. Like, got to stop this. We got to get this thinking out of our culture. It's ridiculous. And most people sit back in their suburban households, and they don't realize the cost of it. The cost of it are lives in prisons, dead drug addicts because of failed, failed policy. And we do it over and over and over. And the more you need to change it, the more people harden, calcify, and say, no, no, we got to keep driving the truck down this road. Until nothing, yeah, I mean, anyway, so that drives me nuts. So that's where my thing... You were lucky to get out of it. That's where my thing on the war on drugs came from. You know, and obviously I'd done a lot of drinking and a lot of drug taking, so I knew a lot about it from a consumer side, let's say. You know, I was a bit of an expert. But I also started learning about the policy. I'm like, policy sucks. It doesn't work. What are we going to do? And now every person in America in the interdiction business, everyone in the DEA, everyone in law enforcement, they will tell you the same thing. Doesn't work. What would work? 
you got to decriminalize. Absolutely. 100%. End prohibition across the board and let the chips fall where they may. Tax it, regulate it, and put the money into treatment for the people that have the problems. Create bed, bed Like what Netherlands has done? Beds and rehabs for the, you know, because here's the thing, like just talking about drug addiction, you're talking about about 12% of the population that has that addictive gene that's going to have the problem. That's in every culture all over the world, 12% going back into time, you know, a little bit of wiggle room, basically 12%. So the policy really needs to address the 12%. You got to get the profit motive out of it to get the criminal gangs out of it, which will, they'll fall out immediately. And then you've got to treat the people with the addiction problem. It's obvious, and you could do it with the taxable revenue you would get if you just regulated it and sold it in the way you sell booze and sell cigarettes. It would work perfectly. Yes, there would be like, you know, a bit of an adjustment period. There would be some problems at first. Everyone's like, oh, but people die of drug overdoses. People die of car wrecks. I'm way more likely to get hit by a car cross or a trolley crossing the street in San Francisco than I am to buy, die of a drug overdose. And if you want to talk about the real problem of drug overdoses, talk about pill addiction, which is legal. The country's, I go to, listen, I know who's dying of drug overdoses. I know. I know better than most people. I see it every day. It's all, it's all pills, all 100%. Nobody dies of heroin anymore or cocaine. It's all pills, so that's which what, is legal. So I mean, that, that, uh, that kind of passion is what uh, drove you to write Traffic when, when you got the BBC serial. Yeah. No, that's not how it worked at all. Okay. So I was writing about the war on drugs for a year, over a year. I was researching. Why? Why did you start? This after you quit? I met, yeah, and I met, I'd quit, and I met Ed Zwick, and he... I wanted to do a satire on the military, and he said I want to do a satire on the war on drugs. And I was like, oh, that's a better idea. So we got this little minimal amount of money, but they gave me a research budget, and I disappeared down a rabbit hole. 14 months. In the, about that time, 14 months later, Steven Soderbergh showed up, and he said, I've got this miniseries traffic. I want to do a movie on the war on drugs. And I said, oh, well, I'm already doing one. You know, We're just set up at Fox. We can't, you know, I'm sorry. He goes, we'll just watch it. So I'd been having... <clears throat> like really a writer's block, but, but more of a nervous breakdown, um, trying to figure out how to get this big subject into a movie. It didn't occur to me to do multiple narrative. Now, I'd written NYPD Blue, A story, B story, C story, D story. Never occurred to me in the film about the war on drugs to fragment the narrative into storylines with different protagonists. So I watched Traffic, and I was like, oh, <laughs> duh, that's how we do it. And I went back to Stephen, and I said, listen, I got good news and bad news. And uh, he, said, well, he said, what's that? And I said, well, the good news is, you know, I'm stealing your idea. I'm, I'm, I've been spending 14 months and I haven't gotten a page written and I'm going to use a multiple narrative. And he goes, how is that good news? And I was like, well, you, you know, it's good news for me. He said, what's the bad news? And I said, the bad news is you're not directing it because I love your filmmaking, you know. And, um, he said, hmm. But I asked Ed, I, was, I went and asked Ed if Ed would be willing to produce and Stephen could direct and that we could use traffic as sort of a bit of a template, which we did for maybe 50% of the movie. Um, and Ed said yes, and then we all threw in together, and it was a really, it turned out to be a really good move. Um, but, you, you know, so the passion, <clears throat> you know, so that, anyway, Syriana, what happened there? I would, that was my next question. So I was I'm literally gonna... sitting around, minding my own business, and these planes run into, uh, you know, the World Trade Center. And I'm in Malibu. You know, the dolphins are jumping out of the water. I'm cutting a movie. When did you wake up to see the news? Did somebody call you about 9-11? Because it was 7 o'clock or 7.45 here in California. When yeah, I, I mean, I was up doing something, you know, and then, and then I either read about it on the Internet. I don't know how I, how I found it. I don't remember. But, I mean, I knew right away, and I was really scared. And then I remember <clears throat> I saw George Bush's first appearance on TV, which they've since tried to yank, you know, and he just looked like a scared child. In Florida. Yeah, he looked like a scared child wearing his dad's clothes. Like, it was so, he, he was so not heroic, you know, and then he showed up later, or we'll get the evildoers, you know, and the whole thing was, was really funny. But, but then, I mean, 9-11 was not funny, it was scary, but the, uh, and tragic, but the, I remember then um, Osama bin Laden, his first statement about it, mm. he said, get your planes out of the Holy Land. And I realized that I didn't know what he was talking about mm. at all. Like, I didn't know what he, what he meant. You know, I loosely knew where the Holy Land was. I sort of knew where Mecca was. I sort of understood, just, you know, Sunni, Shiite, schism, but not much. And so I started looking into it. And then what I really was paying attention to was America's foreign policy changing radically, radically. Like, the ship that's America had taken a hard turn. Someone up in the bow spun the wheel, and the boat was just, like, going a different direction. You know, in terms of 
uh, nation-building policies that we could go, you know, export our democracy, and that that would be a really great idea and work, and and that we could. <clears throat> but that's not a new idea. It was there in the during the Cold War period. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs>